So we had two key questions to ask. What proportion of cancer now um, in Britain is due to exposure to carcinogens in the workforce? In other words, how many cancer deaths, how many new cancers occurring each year are due to exposure to occupational carcinogens? And the second thing we wanted to do was to say, well, suppose we don't do anything, we keep the status quo, what's the predicted future burden of occupationally related cancer? And can we compare different strategies for risk reduction? And the one I'm going to, to, to show you in a few minutes is silica, and again, the construction industry comes very high on our list. You'll see that there's a large team of, uh, from several different organisations, so I'd like to just acknowledge the, the, the large number of people who took part in this. Um, I also want to acknowledge the help of the um, International Agency for Research in Cancer, um, based in Lyon, because they gave us a lot of help, a lot of advice. We, held lots of uh, we had three international workshops throughout. And we used their standards of defining what is a carcinogen um, to decide which occupational carcinogens we should look at. So we took all um, group one human carcinogens, where the animal data, the experimental data is very robust, but so is the human data. So definite human carcinogens and the probable ones, where again the um, experimental evidence is very robust, but perhaps the studies um, in humans are not quite as good as you expect. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview of both the current burden of cancer and then um, give you an example with silica of um, what would happen if we tried different things to reduce the burden of occupational exposure to sil silica. So, um, now, how do I use the pointer? Is it this? Okay. Um, these are just giving you some overall figures on the attributable fraction, the proportion, the numbers of deaths that it translates to, and the number of newly occurring cancers, which is, are the cancer registration, which is 100% cancer registration in this country. So um, I hope you can all see the bottom. <coughs> is it this one that I use or this one? So the top one, the pointer. Mm, not sure. Maybe I'll just wave a, wave a hand. Is it that one? No, oops. Can you go back again? That's it. I'll just wave my hand. Um, if you can see the bottom line here, this is the overall message. What we're saying is that about 5.5% of cancers occurring every year in this country are, are due to occupational exposure to carcinogens in the past. And that translates, if you can think of this as an annual figure, of about 8,000 deaths a year and about 13,500 newly occurring cancers. So it's not an inconsiderable number compared with the total number of fatalities that we get. And as, um, I love the phrase that um, uh, Lawrence used, which is construction is rubbish industry for preventing accidents. It's not so good at preventing cancers, as we'll see in a minute. So 13,500. Now, if you're a decision maker, you might say, OK, well, which are the cancer sites where most of the cancers are due to occupation? And if we look at this column, this is the proportion, you can see that top of the list, not surprisingly, is mesothelioma, where most of it is attributable to occupational exposure to asbestos or para-occupation, where people live around industries or have workers in the household. The second one is sinonasal <coughs> cancer. There's actually only... Um, smoking is slightly related to sinonasal cancer, but snuff is the only one that's sort of um, really associated, um, and I don't think many people take that now. But there are several occupational carcinogens. It doesn't cause very many cancers or deaths, but it's a nasty disease. Lung cancer is our second one here, our third one. Translates to large numbers of deaths, because they have lots of cancer, uh, lung cancers in, in Britain every year, about 30 to 35,000 a year. And... Um, uh, so, uh, 5,500 new cancers, and there are lots of lung carcinogens, as I'll, uh, occupational ones, which I'll show you in a minute. I want to draw your attention to this one, breast cancer. About, this is female breast cancer. 
about 4.5% of female breast cancers we estimate are attributable to occupational carcinogens. That's about 500 deaths a year and nearly 2,000 new breast cancers. And one which doesn't kill you, non-melanoma skin cancer, often occurs on the face, on the arms, occupationally, disfiguring, must cost the health service a lot. Um, even though the, sometimes the procedures are minor, <coughs> think of the number of times you're going to, see, going to have to go and see your GP. So it depends what you're interested in. Do you want to get rid of cancers that are um, a, where a lot are occupationally caused? Are they going to focus on the numbers of deaths? What about the newly occurring cancers, which I think we should be focusing on increasingly because... Um, Fortunately, we're all surviving cancers much better. So which are the most important carcinogens? Now, apologies that these are upwards, but, um, but I'm sure you can work out what they are. These are the newly occurring cancers in order across here. And be because we've got mesotheliomas, lung cancers, not surprisingly, top of the list is asbestos exposure in, uh, uh, in occupational. But you'll notice here that we not only have lung cancers, large numbers of lung cancers and mesotheliomas, we also have a few stomach cancers and laryngeal cancers. And if we updated this, IARC, the um, International Agency of Research in Cancer, have now re-evaluated asbestos exposure, and cervix cancer, colorectal cancer, and pharyngeal cancer are also um, uh, either group 1 or 2A cancers. So this is an underestimate. Secondly, shift work. We're talking <coughs> night work here. <coughs> Millions of women work night work, and it's associated with disruption of the circadian rhythm, which associ is associated with hormonal changes, which increases the risk of breast cancer. Lots of studies going on, including some funded by the Health and Safety Executive, to try and work out what shift pattern patterns we should be um, aiming for. Secondly, mineral oils. We need to take into account different routes of exposure here. Dermal exposure for skin cancers, inhalation exposure for cyanonasal and lung, but both for bladder cancer. If you didn't know it, bladder cancer is associated with exposure to mineral oils. Uh, followed by solar radiation, silica, diesel energy source. I wanted to um, uh, point out that there are two occupations here, painters and welders, and sometimes IR can't actually find the evidence for exactly which um, exposure is causing the cancer, so they, they classify a whole um, uh, uh, occupation, and uh, we have uh, painters as a whole, um, including painters in the construction industry. Lots of lung cancer carcinogens, and here's all the ones we actually um, did uh, estimation on, and you can see very easily which are coming out top. Uh, asbestos, silica, diesel engine exhaust, mineral oils, but several metals, dioxins, work as a welder, and so on. Which industries? Well, here's where the construction industry comes up. 50, over 50% 50 of our cancers are occurring, uh, sorry, not 50%, but a large proportion, 5,500 of the 13,500, are occurring in the construction industry. And I'll show you some more statistics on this in a minute. Followed by um, the service industries, which are repairs, domestic, um, uh, dry cleaning, and hairdressing, and so on, where the exposures are, are low, but an awful lot of people are exposed to low levels, and so we mustn't forget that. It's not just the high exposed people, but the people that are exposed to low levels, which still have a small risk. So that's why we get several asbestos-related cancers occurring here. Um, and uh, transport, obviously, diesel engine exhaust, DE, um, comes up as being high. Next is the manufacturing, and I wanted to bring out the metal workers and mineral oils, both dermal and inhalation, very important to, um, in terms of the cancers, that, uh, followed by um, a small number associated with agriculture and farming. Just to tell, show you the construction, here's the figure we've got, and we can, we can look separately at the, um, some of the different groups, the painters and decorators and the roofers, and including the road repairers. So fair number 
of um, construction workers. And here's what they're exposed to. That's the num 16 different carcinogens we had to look at for the construction industry. And if you look at the proportion of the orange bar, that shows you how important the construction industry is in the total burden for asbestos, for solar radiation, for silica, and so on. So the construction industry really is important. And the other thing that one has to remember is that they're not just looking at asbestos and, mes um, and mesothelium and lung, but other diff um, cancers as well, so nine different cancer sites. We've actually done um, melanoma now, which is the one that is fatal if you don't get it early enough, and we estimate that 100 construction workers a year will get a melanoma, and 20 people will die, construction workers will die each year from a melanoma, from solar radiation. So try getting a construction worker to wear sun cream. We can perhaps discuss that. Now, I just want to give you a very quick overview of what we did in prediction. We said, OK, so when we go forward in time, we've got a legacy of past exposure. Some people in the past will move forward and have new exposures. The workers now will have new exposures, but they've got a legacy of past exposures. So as we gradually move forward, we're getting more and more into the future and predicting what the exposures are going to do. And we can introduce things like introduce a limit, a standard, <coughs> reduce a limit. We can improve compliance. We can say, well, suppose we only do it for the big sites that Lawrence has been talking about. What would happen if we just did it for them and not the small and medium-sized industries? So I'm going to give you the example of silica, where we do have a limit at the moment, 0.1 milligram per meter cubed, but we actually have data to show that only about a third of industries where there is exposure comply with that limit. So what we've experimented with doing is reducing, halving the limit, and you might say that's ridiculous, you've made it a quarter, we've never reached that, improving the compliance from a third to 90%, which you might say is a little bit ambitious, and then looking at how it changes um, with different size workplaces. So, if we don't do anything, we're going to have about 800 new cancers, um, lung cancers, every year occurring due to silica exposure. And that's going to stay the same um, in the, as we go through the years. But supposing we halve the limit, then we're going to save about 200 cancers in 2060. If we do it again, which we might say is impractical, about another 200. But the big impact here is if you look at this third line, I don't know whether you can see this, but if you keep the limit the same but improve the compliance to 90%, you, you get an immediate saving of nearly 700 lung cancers. So that immediately contrasts compliance as against uh, all the bother, and people will tell you, I'm sure the health and safety will, um, of uh, how you do uh, actually reducing a limit. It's not a straightforward thing to do. I can see Karen um, laughing. Here's what would happen, it's just to show you. These are the six scenarios here and the different years. Now, the message I want to get over here is these bars, because the, the, the tool is designed to reduce exposure, so you'd expect this. But you might be saying, well, why isn't anything happening for the next 30 years? We're an ageing population, cancer is a disease of the elderly. So the number of cancers anyway in Britain is going to go up. Um, and I hope the health service is prepared for that. So even if the exposures are going down um, and the proportion is going down, the actual numbers of cancers will, will, will go up. And because of the legacy of past exposure, um, moving forward, remember what I said, um, there's going to be this latency with cancer. Like uh, with a mesothelioma, the average age of getting a mesothelioma is 60, and it's after 40 years after you've been first exposed. So a lot of cancers occur <laughs> when people have retired. Um, and that is why, for the first 30 years, really none of the interventions I've talked about have very little impact. Now, um, what, so what we're doing is when we intervene, we're, we're really focusing on the new workers, and it's a really important message. We can't leave it as it is. 
just to emphasise and uh, to contrast with some of the things Lawrence has said, suppose you do the halving of the limit, and so you've got your 200 saved, and you increase the number of proportion of people that you um, improve the compliance. So if you get the compliance only in the large companies Lawrence has been talking about, you save another 100, so the 200 to the 295. If you get it to the companies that have more than 50 employees, another 50 between there. But if you get it for all companies which employ people, including the small ones, those that employ under 50, you're going to save an extra 200. And when you get the self-employed, another 200. So the message from this one is that Get the compliance up and focus on the small and medium-sized industries. And that's a challenge for the big construction industries to put the programmes in and, and help the small companies. So um, just go, my last slide on prevention. <coughs> Occupational cancer is a, is a concern, but the trouble is not many of them occur now, they occur because of past exposures. Melanoma might be one of the ones that's, um, you know, you, you get melanoma after a lot of skin exposure to sunshine um, and you don't need that many years. You're not talking 50 years. It's actually a relatively small number of carcinogens, so we ought to be able to um, focus on those and then the health and safety executives certainly are um, from, these, um, from these results. If we don't do anything in the future, we're going to get the roughly the same number of cancers every year, 12 to 13,000 every year due to occupational carcinogens. And we really need to focus on small and medium-sized industries. And there are a lot of, as, um, uh, which would go with the reduction of dusts that Lawrence was talking about. If we reduce dust for respiratory disease, we're going to reduce them for the uh, respiratory cancers. Uh, solar radiation, I think, is a challenge, and we might want to discuss this later. And shift work, um, um, on how we optimise shift work in this 24-hour working um, uh, society we live in is going to be a real challenge. Thanks very much. <laughs>